Welcome to the Patron Saints of Pop Culture Podcast. I'm Miguel Covarrubias. And I'm Kathy Covarrubias. And today, let's talk about Netflix's show, Dead to Me. So, uh, spoilers if you have not yet caught this show. It is fantastic, uh, but we'll get to that review in just a minute. I was minute. about to say, we're just going to jump into the reviews, apparently. No, but uh, spoilers for it. Yes. So, uh, we are going to be talking a lot about most of the show. So, if you have not yet seen it, go and uh, binge watch it. It uh, will take you maybe a day. Uh, as it's Mm -hmm. only, the episodes are only about half an hour each. Yeah, so it's going to be, that's one thing I liked about it, is that it's a quick thing. So um, it's not like some of these shows where you have to dedicate an hour to an hour and a half to watch it. So there you go. All right, so our summary and review. Uh, Summary. So much actually happens, but it's mostly interpersonal stuff. So, um a woman grieves the loss of her husband and uh, her and uh, deals with the out uh, acting out of her children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the best way to put it. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a woman um, is trying to deal with the mysterious death of her husband because he was murdered with a hit and run. Um, she meets a friend, um, and she is dealing with her kids. Uh, but then her friendship with her friend becomes very complicated. Okay. Um, I really liked it. It's, uh, it's a dark comedy, so it's uh, you know not quite your average sitcom. Mm-hmm. Um, it uh, deals with a lot of heavy topics, and I, I loved that. I loved that they, they took the opportunity to real, really deal with some bigger life issues that we don't normally talk about, especially with grief and with uh, being able to say no. Um, As you can uh, go and see on our website, uh, in our Saints Gallery, Jen Harding is actually one of uh, our saints already. Uh, We named her the patron saint of saying no. Yep. And then also, too, not only do they talk about topics that people have normally shied away from, but they talk about it in a way that... I would say it's a little bit more on the taboo-ish side of things. Oh, taboo, but it's also accessible. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it, you, it, it can still be taboo and accessible. Yeah. It's both. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was saying. <laughs> okay. Um, not as taboo where you're not going to get into it kind of thing. I think we have different definitions of taboo. There are different de- different definitions of taboo like there's taboo where like nobody's going to talk about it and if you bring it up in normal conversation people aren't going to be able to get into that conversation and then there's taboo where it's like oh that's that's complicated but i can still talk about this because i can relate to a bit of this okay i know that's complicated (laughs) (laughs) all right your review um i also liked it um it, of course, it was, again, one of those shows that came in my life when I was dealing with kind of sort of the same things. I mean, obviously, my spouse did not, like, die under mysterious circumstances, but um, still, there was a lot of parallels in um, in the show um, compared to my own life. So, that's why I liked it. But it was also funny and not, like, sad and depressing. And or- also, too, another thing that I liked about it, sorry to say, <laughs> is that with... Um, well, obviously you've already given spoilers, so hopefully you've already watched it, but whenever, the one thing I really liked is whenever you thought Judy was going to tell the truth, she didn't. Like, it was always yeah. like this, like, is she going to do it? Is she going to do it? Is she? Oh, she didn't tell the truth. Okay. Which I think plays into that dark humor a bit because it's something that like, like you need to, mm-hmm. you're kind of rooting for her too, but you also know the consequences if she ever does. Mm-hmm. And, like, how that kind of plays out. Yeah. Well, you obviously know how much it's eating at her. Like. Yeah. You know she wants to. She just. Yeah. Things are preventing her. So, I really want to focus on Jen for our discussion right now. Primarily because um, I, I really liked the way that the show kind of talked about recovery in your own way. That Jen. Jen was. Not your typical kind of, oh, she's going to be like typical... uh, Grieving widow. Grieving widow or um, I guess typically written 
grieving widow Mm -hmm. because there are tropes that people have to kind of abide by when they're writing a piece of fiction like this that it's it's not necessarily based on any one person that it's more just kind of an every person grieving widow kind of idea yeah kind of like the constructed idea of how a widow should grieve exactly and this wasn't typical this was very much more relatable, more kind of a narrative style of the complexity of life, how it is that, you know, all of our lives are are complex and they cannot fit into those narrative archetype uh, trope styles. And this was one of the great things that I loved about the show. And I really wanted to focus especially on her recovery because this is something that I think... um, not just for me, but for anybody who's gone through traumatic loss can relate to is that recovery is not something that is done by somebody else's timeline. It's not done by somebody else's idea ideals. Uh, and people are going to push you to try to fit into their idea of what recovery looks like. Recovery for everybody looks different. And this creates connections and lost connections along the way. You you end up gaining new friends and you end up losing a lot of your former friends because they don't understand the recovery process. They don't understand that it's unique to every individual that's going through this recovery process. Have you had an instance where you were going through a recovery process uh, such as this and you lost friends and how did it really feel to you? Well, um, after the first miscarriage, I took it like really hard, like it was real bad. And I just kind of like withdrew from my friend group and uh, just kind of became like a a homebody because I didn't want to bother them with my grief Mm -hmm. and no one checked in on me. Like they knew what happened. They knew I was upset and grieving, but no one reached out to see how I was doing or to see if there was anything that they could do to help me feel better. Yeah. For me, it was really um, kind of diving back into some of my own bad personal habits. And I mean, this was, it was just bad coping mechanisms. And we've talked about this before, um, especially was, you know, I didn't, I didn't know how to make connections. I didn't know how to, Because I think that for everybody, at least, um, this one part is similar, is that we need connections with other human beings to be able to fully recover from whatever it is that we're recovering from. And I think that's that's probably the only similarity that that there is in the recovery process for everybody. Mm -hmm. And and for me, I mean, I know for me, it's extremely difficult to make friends as an adult. I mean, how how do you make friends as an adult? Uh, well, how oh, we met one couple. They literally came up to us and was like, hey, you have a kid around the same age as my kid. Join Wanna this be group. Fr- yeah, join this group. <laughs> well, and I mean, granted, this is not, this is not going to be a, the case across the board. So like, not everybody's going to But that's hard to, to do. Him. I mean, I legit was like, freaked out yeah (laughs) yes so i mean and i don't think i would i mean i i'm a little bit more comfortable now like inviting um people to join that um group that we're in yeah um just because it's more of in a group setting so it's like i don't know easier you know what i mean it's less uh socially awkward yes it's not as personal you know i'm but i'm not about to invite somebody over to our house after have only you know talking to them for like a half an hour and i did make a brief mention last week but there is uh there's a podcast that npr did um recently and i I, it's kind of how to do stuff uh podcast and it was about men and making friendships and especially as men and as adults uh, especially that we're we're taught most of our lives that it's not okay to be vulnerable it's not okay to to reveal that vulnerable part of ourselves and that's the really i think the only way that you can make friends is is being Mm -hmm. able to be comfortable with 
vulnerability. Yeah. And I mean, Brene Brown has like tons of these different things on, on being vulnerable. And that's the way to have a group is, you know, an acceptance is, is being vulnerable and opening up about yourself. And you notice this about Jen is that she doesn't, she doesn't really open up to Judy until after they found the similarities in each other. Mm hmm. Um, especially about the show that they both really enjoyed, um, like similar circumstances that they went through and how how hurt she was by the fact that Judy lied about her fiancé dying. Yep. Uh, even though Steve was kind of, you know, was dead to her. So Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I'm not going to talk about Steve, but another Netflix series that's about grief that has a Steve in it. I mean similarities yep for sure but i think another important part of the uh, recovery process and this looks different to everybody is forgiving oneself and this is this is not compromising yourself this is not compromising to fitting into somebody else's idea of forgiveness for yourself it is forgiveness for yourself on a level that you can accept and this is this is all kinds of guilt. Like for instance, with Jen, when she was she feeling guilty about uh, what was it hitting her husband uh, before he went out on his uh, late night jog or whatever he was doing. Yeah, she did end up hitting him after a very heated argument. Well, well, not only that, but her son saw it too, and I think that's also another reason why. Yeah, and why he was acting out, and mm-hmm. why he had the gun, and yeah, all kinds of. Just bad things that were going on. Yep. Well, and I, I think that it was very difficult for her to forgive herself for that, you know, really kind of taking on the guilt of, uh, you know, she was the reason why he was out on the road. She was the reason why he was out, uh, you know, away from the house and why she kind of doesn't want to necessarily share that guilt with Judy. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, because... I mean, also, too, she has to deal with the fact that, like, her last memory of him is not a happy one. No. And same with him. Like, his last memory of her, not a happy one. Well, and she comes to find out worse things about yeah. him was, you know. And that's the thing about that, about grief is that we, we always want to kind of memorialize the person and, and remember just the good things about somebody. But some people are just... You know, straight up jerks. Yep. And like, it's going to be hard to remember the good things about them. And it's okay to think negative thoughts about somebody after their passing. Absolutely. And I think it's also healthy, too, because it can cause some confusion as to whether or not how you feel is actually justified. Like, there's definitely been people in my life who've passed away. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm kind of upset they passed away. But... Were they the nicest person in the world? No. <laughs> and I am not about to say that they were. I'm not about to say that they were almost angel-like. Yeah. Because I've been to some funerals when they tell about how, oh, this this person was so godly and you know t- took their faith so seriously and was such a good Christian. And I'm thinking to myself, that person was one of the meanest people that I knew. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and and that's the thing is that recovery for everybody is going to look different. I mean, you can't always, like, memorialize somebody. Because the more you memorialize somebody, the worse you make yourself. Mm-hmm. The more guilty, the more guilt you pile on yourself and you're not able to forgive yourself. And so you're compromising on who you are. Yeah. Um, there's this another video that I shared this week from Brene Brown um, that she talks about this, about... Uh, compromise of oneself is that that's one thing she will never do she will never compromise you know that on who she is because she is who she is and and you know if she fits into somebody else's mold of who they think she should be then she's no longer herself Mm -hmm. and that's that's one of the biggest things especially in the grieving process if somebody wants you to grieve a certain way or somebody wants you to be a certain way they're going to manipulate you they're going to try to get not you like her mother-in-law like her mother-in-law like steve did with judy but we're not gonna talk about that right now um like 
there are so many things that, you know, people will manipulate you and try to make you into the person that they want you to be. But you shouldn't compromise on who you are. You shouldn't negotiate who you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the great things about the the great the only great thing about the grieving process is that it it cuts away a lot of that uh, chaff. I, I I'm using biblical terms because I have no idea what in the world the uh, regular terms are for this. <laughs> the bad stuff in you that that shouldn't be there. You know, it cuts it away and kind of gets you down to what you really are. It purifies. It's like the metallic purification process. It's you know kind of taking away all the bad stuff. Well, I wouldn't. I. Uh, I don't really like the word purify because that kind of gives imagery of like <laughs> yeah. virgins and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that opens up all kinds of stuff. But See, like, this is why I'm more, saying I need better terms. Yeah, a more true you. More true you. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a better way of putting it. Yeah, so <laughs> that's that's a, a, a truer you is probably the best way of putting that. Um, and, and that's the thing is that change is going to happen. And that's, I think... One of the beautiful things about the show is that Jen and Judy are both looking for that truer version of themselves, and they're both working on themselves. They mm -hmm. show a good recovery process from grief and from... Well, I would say Judy's not so good, but... Okay. <laughs> but I, 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 you know, change is, is coming. She is trying to make herself better. She is trying to make herself better. Yes. And that's that's the point that I'm making, is yes. that... Change is coming. She's she's becoming a truer version of who she is. And, uh, you know, it's so many of us want to fit into that idea of and I, the way that I've put it before is that we keep trying to be perfect caterpillars, but you can't be a perfect caterpillar. You got to be that imperfect butterfly that you are, is that change is going to happen and it's going to hurt and it's not going to be pleasant, but you're becoming that butterfly and honestly i would be much rather be an imperfect butterfly than a perfect caterpillar any day that was beautiful miguel <laughs> thank you <laughs> all right so talking about judy and her um not being perfect because i think we can all agree even at the very end like right before the very end she's still not perfect well neither is jen well no i i mean she did just murder somebody so that it means she's not <laughs> perfect but <laughs> well see that's that's the thing that's what I, I brought up at the very beginning is that they don't fit into the cookie cutter trope um grieving widow or or uh friend of grieving widow mm -hmm. well judy obviously is complicated you yes. know um i do sympathize with her quite a bit because uh, we have gone through our own, like, uh, fertility struggles. Mm -hmm. Not only having miscarriages, but also struggling to get pregnant. And so that's that can drive you crazy. <laughs> it's It can. Oh, to put it mildly, yes. Yes. Um, I was so stressed out about it. I It basically consumed me. And the doctors weren't giving us answers, which was probably worse because it was like I couldn't get pregnant and they had no idea why. And every single time they did a test, every single time they did um, a surgery, still couldn't figure out why. And to this day, I don't have an answer as to why. It's still just unknown infertility. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they even uh, put a camera inside her uterus, which, you know... <laughs> I saw the pictures of, and then they were immediately lost after that for some reason. Yeah, so that's weird. So <laughs> only her husband and her son have seen the inside of her uterus. Well, no, the doctors did take a look at the pictures. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But for some reason, the pictures disappeared. But that's a whole other story. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, so suffering and the stress, especially in what she... Went through after years, because she went through that struggle for many more years than we did. Um, yeah. And I can only imagine what I would end up doing or be being after having to wait that many years. And wh what was it, like seven miscarriages for them? I don't remember, but a, a lot. I mean, yeah. and 
it even got to the point to where like they were really really close to having a kid and everything seemed fine they you know had the nursery set up and I mean for us we did we well we didn't purchase it ourselves but we were given baby things like when we first initially found out we were pregnant and I was I couldn't even look at him yeah. Like when we lost him, like I'm like, I, this makes, it just made me so angry. Anyway, this is not about me. This is about Judy. <laughs> um, but so anyway, the suffering and the stress that she went through can make you cause, I mean, make you do some really stupid shit. And she, part of her trying to cope was trying to like be another person. Yeah. You know, in a way, um, which is why she kind of makes up all these lies and, kind of imagines a different world for herself. In what way do you identify with Judy? Oh, well, obviously the the miscarriages and like making them that they kind of push you into weird places. And I think that's that's the thing with uh recovery from a traumatic event like that is like if you let people dictate how you recover, it's going to drive you into weird places. Mm -hmm. And you're going to end up doing some things that are not just hurtful to you, but hurtful to other people. Yep. And, um, well, obviously I can also relate to Judy in that. But also when I was in high school, I think I've said this before, but I was definitely a pathological liar. Like I didn't really value myself very much. And I thought that the only way that I could make friends was to lie about things yeah and in a way that's kind of what judy's doing she's like the only way that i can try to feel good is to lie about the things that i've gone through because people just won't understand um so i kind of can understand that now you know i am not a pathological liar anymore yeah i mean how do you no, I'm just kidding. I'm not a pathological liar anymore. Um, and it's hard to get yourself out of the web of lies um, that you've created. I, I remember in high school, there was a certain point in time that I was just like, there's no no effing way that I can get out of this. <laughs> you know, like I backed myself into a corner and I just kind of like hoped and prayed that it went away. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, it's just thinking that that's the punchline to one of my favorite jokes. How do you get an elephant out of Safeway? Take the F out of safe and the F out of way. The punchline. There's no F in way. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> I'm a dad. I got to do dad jokes. <laughs> so, really, the true way of getting yourself out of, like, these web of lies that you've made, especially so... Not just like little white lies, but like very like lies that dictate how other people see you type of lies. The only way that you can really get out of that is either one, just run away and like just get out of the situation period so that nobody knows, mm. which is kind of, uh, well, kind of sort of what I did. I, um, after um, I graduated high school and went to college, I just, you know, just was like, okay, this is it. I am not going to lie. Like, I am not going to lie about myself to make uh, myself look good. I'm going to be, like, honest with everybody about, how, like, who I really am. Like, this is it. And it worked. I mean, it wasn't as bad as I thought. People still liked me. I yeah. still made friends. <laughs> well, see, and that, as as we just discussed, was that it's it's the really the only way to make friends is, is to be vulnerable. It's mm -hmm. to allow yourself... To to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the other way to get out of your web of lies is to just be truthful about it and word vomit it all out, all at once. Yeah. That's that's the path that uh, Judy kind of took there. So. Uh, yeah. Um, but... The thing, the thing with mine is I think like mine was the easier way out though because I didn't have to really confess to anybody yeah. my lies. Um, I'm like 85% sure that most people picked up on my bullshit and kind of figured it out on their own, um, which is probably why I'm not friends with any of my high school friends, which is okay with me anyway. 
Um, with hers, the way, like, just word vomiting it, I mean, that was really risky. You, not only was she risking jail, obviously, uh, but she was risking losing somebody who she felt was, like, a really good friend and really important to her. And she really did love the boys. And by coming clean, she was losing all of that. Yeah. And that can be scary, too. Well, it's it's losing the it's going through a different traumatic uh, event. Then you're you're kind of revealing a different vulnerability, and you're you're wanting that person, especially the person that you hurt, and that's what it makes it so complicated. Is that you're wanting that person that you hurt to still accept you and still forgive you and and welcome you, even though you've been vulnerable. Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> You've been terrible, and you've you're you're being vulnerable in that moment. It's it's not a pleasant experience, as you know, somebody who's had to do that a few times and and own up to just kind of the crap that he did in his life. You know that that guilt is something that you never really get rid of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one props to Judy though, because even after all that, she. Um, I don't know if she, she goes to a service or if she just goes to like, maybe like a, like a prayer group in like a Jewish synagogue. I can't remember, but, but she goes there and, um, she's like, this was really helpful, you know? Oh wait, no, I think it was a funeral. It was a funeral. Yeah. For, um, for the old guy. um, Yeah. For where she works. Abe. Abe. Yes. Um, so she was like, you know, thank you so much for doing this. Like. I really do feel like like he's in heaven or something like that. And, uh, yeah, he's in a better place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the rabbi's like, well, there is no heaven or hell. Like, yeah. Like, we Which, don't believe that. Yeah, that's a very traditional Jewish belief. And we've mm-hmm. talked about this before, especially about afterlife, is that there is that, you know, in the Jewish tradition, there is no afterlife. Mm-hmm. So then she's like, well, then how, like, how do you get, like, what makes you, like, a good person then? Because, um, you know, in a lot of, Christian faiths, like, you basically have to, like, earn points or something, like, to get to heaven. Well, not earn points, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Like, you have to be a good person according to this book in order to get into heaven. And that's why you want to be a good person is to get into heaven. And in the Jewish tradition, there there isn't that idea of heaven to, like, force you to be a good person. You just have to be a good person because... <laughs> Because that's it's, how you, you should be. Yeah, it's your life. And yeah. that's, you know, that's all you have. Yeah. Just make it a good one. And so the rabbi's like, what you have to do is just go to the person that you've wronged and try your best to make amends. That's all you can do. Yeah. And so um, I really, I that's kind of how, like, I kind of go through life now. Like, I just got to, if I've wronged somebody, just try to make amends. Because that's, that's the best way to go about it, in my opinion. Yeah, and I do find myself being much more kind of uh, Jewish in my approach to faith and, and afterlife and, and things like that, is that there is, there is only this life that we, like, that's why you need to make things better. That's why you need to be a better person is because life is short. Mm-hmm. It's, it's too short for you to live with. The guilt of what you've done, and the only way you can do that is by fessing up, by getting, by trying to make amends as best you can, mm-hmm. and working hard to be a better person and to enjoy what it, what you do have. Absolutely. Um, so now, like, if I, I don't know if any of my friends from high school listen to this, which I probably don't, but if there's anything that you have a question on about something that I said in high school, I mean, ask me. I'll tell you the truth now. Uh, so you didn't have a boyfriend in Canada who went to a different school so we wouldn't know him? I actually did not ever tell that lie. But I do know somebody who told a lie like that. Oh, okay. But it wasn't you. And uh, <laughs> cut out pictures of a model from a magazine and was like, yeah, here's, here's a, her modeling picture. No, I, no I, that's not a lie I told. <laughs> no, talking about the, uh, the guy who did say that lie or person who did say that lie oh um i don't remember if he actually did do a like cutting out of a picture but he did definitely tell people that he had a girlfriend up in canada (laughs) that he met over the summer well when we do stranger things season three (laughs) maybe we can talk about that uh disbelief of somebody's (laughs) 
<laughs> somebody's uh, girlfriend until the end where they sing yep. never ending story to each other. <laughs> All right. So moving on to our saints of the season. Saints of the season. Saints season. of the season. Yeah. I need a drink of water. <laughs> Me too. Um, I'm going to go with St. Chris. Obviously, I've already done St. Jen. She is in our Saints Gallery on the website. Go check that out. We've got a lot of Saints up there. Uh, obviously, Steve is not uh, part of the St. Steves, but uh, there are a few Steves from the other Netflix series on there. So go check those out uh, at patronsaintsofpopculture.org. And uh, yeah, let us know if you like any of those. I've left comments available for those uh, if you'd like to, uh, you know, say something about the saint that, while you're there. Anyway, uh, for me, it's uh, St. Chris. Um, Who is her realtor partner, if you can't yes. remember? Um, for two reasons. Uh, the first one is the ability to just put truth bombs wherever he is and whatever he's doing that he's just like truth bomb. That's a miracle. I think that's a, a highly admirable trait uh, because it takes somebody who is definitely secure in who and what they are that they're able to speak the truth and that people will still accept them and love them for who they are. Mm -hmm. And so the second miracle would be running the children's choir at his church uh, and just being uh, who he is. I mean, like that's that was just amazing to see was that you know he was he didn't let that uh, take it out take him over like his faith was not something that it was like making him be like hey you should come to my church or anything else like that it was no, just I mean, like it clearly was it was i mean obviously yeah. it's important to him but you know but it's not something that it was it was him yeah well i don't know the choir is kind to him <laughs> he does tell judy like you have to leave. They're not ready yet. You know? <laughs> it, well, that's that's just performance anxiety. <laughs> um, but I would say that that's a miracle in and of itself. Running anything that is, has to do with children or teenagers at a church takes a lot. Because it, it really it really drains you of you. Mm -hmm. And I he was still himself. Yep. And so that's a second miracle. All right, um, so my saint um, is going to be Karen, and we don't see her very much um, in this series, but I thought I would um, bestow the sainthood upon her for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, she saw her neighbor was in pain, and she did the best thing that she knew, which was give her a very disgusting casserole. Who puts raisins in a taco casserole? I, uh, and then who asked, was there too many raisins? Not, not the whole, did you like the raisins or was the raisins too much? Like, did I put too many in? Did I put too many in? As in like, they belong there. <laughs> so, like, no, they don't. It, which in itself is a miracle because she's very confident about the fact that raisins <laughs> need to go in a taco casserole. Well, why? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, that's so, offensive. That's offensive to my Mexican heritage. That's, a, that's offensive to everybody who likes tacos. Period. <laughs> you like tacos, anyway. Okay. Okay, moving on from the raisin incident, but that still took a lot of courage, like to recognize that her neighbor was struggling and she didn't know how to help. So this was the thing that she did, and um, I'm kind of the same way. Like if somebody is struggling and needs help, like I'm like. Here's some baked goods. <laughs> I don't know how else I can help. I can definitely stay and listen if you are willing to talk. That is another thing that I can do. Other than that, I don't know. So here's something yummy. Yeah. That does not contain raisins unless it's like oatmeal raisin cookies. Um, so that's kind of tough to do. Yep. Also, Because a, a lot of times now people just kind of, if something bad happens to somebody they know, they like, and they hide away. So... Anyway, well, and there. and I, I have to think, I have to reiterate here is that when we say miracle, it's basically not taking the easiest path. Yeah. It's how we define it is, you know, you did something that was difficult to do. Exactly. Yeah. And then um, another miracle, she accepted Jen's request to come over the very last episode. Yeah. And she clearly had... Like, no clue what to do. She's like, wait, hold on. I might have a friend. What do I do? 
and then she goes off like, do I need to bring something? Like, what time? Like, what? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> and that that can be scary and exciting. And I think as adults, we've all experienced the whole like, could this be a blossoming friendship? And the whole anxiety that comes along with that situation. Oh, so yeah. um, I definitely want to add a little blessing in for her for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, those are our, our saints for the episode. We've got uh, Chris and Karen. And, uh, you know, we need to uh, wish Karen good luck uh, here in the later on in September because uh, she's on the front lines along with Kyle's for uh, the rating of Area 51. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I forgot about that. I was like, wait, what now? What's going on? Okay. <laughs> And we also want to uh, say stay safe out there in Florida. If uh, you're in Florida and you're listening to this uh, on Sunday or on Monday, um, you know that uh, Hurricane Dorian's coming through. So stay safe. Mm -hmm. And also um, stop by our website. uh, Stop by our Facebook page, which is at Patron Saints of Pop Culture. And also our Instagram at the Patron Saints of Pop Culture. And wish Miguel a happy birthday because it's going to be his birthday on the 1st. Yeah, well, thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's one of those birthdays that is like, well, I'm turning 36. Great. So mm-hmm. you're gonna die soon. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I am just bringing reality to the situation. Uh, what a loving I'm wife you are. <laughs> be, I'm trying to be open and honest, just like Chris. Okay. All right. <laughs> So um, next week, we're probably going to be getting to Stranger Things Season 3. And uh, yeah, so with all of that being said, we invite you to come and join the conversation. Bye.